Welcome to the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies and welcome to Helsinki for those of you who come from out of town. Um, what we'll do uh, now is just before we get to uh, an introduction of the themes of our symposium and the dictatorship of failure, perspectives on the political and economic crisis in uh, Europe, um, we'll give the floor first to the director of the Helsinki Collegium and then move on to a small introductions of the general themes of the symposium to then go on to um, the keynote speech by our distinguished uh, guest, uh, Kostas Lapavitsas. So without further ado, I'll introduce to you Sammy Pilstrom, the director of the Collegium. Thanks, Alex. Uh, <clears throat> so good morning, dear colleagues, dear guests. Just, just a, a brief word of welcome on behalf of the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. It's my great pleasure and honor to open this conference and welcome you all to this, this international symposium. Uh, this is in a way part of, uh, as we say, it's part of the official academic program of the Helsinki Collegium this year and, and I'm deeply grateful to the two main organizers of the event, Alex and Philippe, who have done a lot of work uh, this this fall uh, with this project and, and obviously I would also like to thank Maria Soukki and Kirsi Reyes from the uh, Collegium admin team uh, who, who have made this practically possible. Let me very briefly use, just use this opportunity to introduce our institution in, in general terms uh, as, as some of you may be new to the Collegium uh, so, so what we are is an independent institute within the University of Helsinki. We were founded 2001, so, so this is still a relatively new uh, academic unit within the university. Our basic mission is to enhance scholarly excellence in the humanities and social sciences understood broadly, including law, behavioral sciences, theology and so forth. And in addition to that, we very strongly seek to promote international and, and interdisciplinary cooperation in research in these academic areas. We currently host approximately 50 fellows working on a wide variety of topics in these fields. So we are one of the so-called institutes for advanced study that, that operate in various countries, both within traditional universities and in some cases also independently of universities. As such an institute we are clearly one of the most international research units of the University of Helsinki and of the Finnish Academia generally, especially in, in, in the fields of humanities and social sciences. At the moment approximately one half of our fellows are from outside Finland. Some of our special fellowships are invitational, they are in those cases usually based on some some program uh, maintained with, externally, uh, with external funding, but we, we also have a kind of a core fellowship program which is based on an extremely competitive application procedure with an internationally open call annually uh, for research proposals. Uh, usually the acceptance rate is around 4%. Uh, our two main organizers today, Alex and Philippe, have both entered the Collegium via this, this uh, tough selection process. Now this fall again we, we received some 360 applications. This time as much as 62% of them came from outside Finland, so we're sort of gradually trying to, to become even more international. Out of that large group we can presumably select only around 10 or 12 new fellows next year. <coughs> Obviously organizing symposia and workshops of this kind is among the core activities of, of the Collegium. Uh, there are different types of events we, we organize and, and, and uh, this is one of the, as I said, one of the so-called official uh, Collegium symposia this year. Uh, and I think it's, it's clear to everybody that the topic of this event of this event fits our interdisciplinary aims particularly well. Well, I'm, I'm not a political theorist or an economist, and my own background is in philosophy, 
so I'm not really an expert on, on your uh, symposium topic, but, but of course it's, it's clear to everybody, it's easy for us all to agree that there could har hardly be any more timely topic for an academic symposium than, uh, than this, this European crisis in its various dimensions. And, and I really look forward to, the, uh, to seeing how, how the different uh, disciplinary perspectives on this issue are integrated in this interdisciplinary discussion today and tomorrow. Although, unfortunately, I, I won't be able to participate in even <coughs> nearly all of the sessions. Um, so this is obviously a topic that cannot simply be understood from the point of view of any single discipline. It, it does require a strong interdisciplinary orientation. Um, so, once more, you're all most warmly welcome to this conference and I, I, I hope you will, you will have an interesting exchange of academic ideas today and, and tomorrow. Uh, at this point I would like to ask our two main organizers, Alex and Philippe, to, to introduce the topic and, and program in, in some more detail as, as, as well as to introduce our first keynote speaker, Kostas Lapavitsas, and I will then uh, continue to chair this first keynote session. So thank you once more for setting up this whole event and, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sami. I will also start by saying that I'm also a philosopher and not an expert in this field, so we are equal on that. But it, it's very nice to see all of you here and I hope that you will enjoy this, this, this conference. I'm going to make some, some brief remarks on the, what motivated us to choose this topic and try to organize this conference and then Alex will continue with some other aspects and then we will then proceed to the keynote address. A crisis is a terrible thing to waste, someone recently said. Uh, the exact meaning of the expression need not concern us here, but it is an important reminder of the political opportunity the current European sovereign debt crisis presents. If we will be able to introduce into the debate about the financial solution for the crisis, the debate about the kind of society we want to live in, then the crisis and its solution will not look in the end as a complete waste and a terrible failure. As it happens, the old political economical models of organization of European societies are increasingly be being threatened by the failure of political agents to respond to degradation of the economic environment. The need to contain costs continue to drain resources from the traditional state supported functions such as healthcare, social security, education, while at the same time these functions are increasingly subjected to a private model of management when not simply transferred to private corporations. The role of the citizenry in shaping these policies has been marginal and any talk of public consultation is quickly dismissed as populist. All those functions are being re-evaluated according to a certain conception of state and state intervention whose economic premises are presented as being above contestation. They are built into the only possible solution for the crisis. Instead of promoting a public debate as wide and inclusive as possible, politicians, governmental agencies and supranational institutions justify the absence of public debate and consultation with a state of emergency. And the, the legitimation of the financial solution is done by appealing to its non-ideological objectivity implemented by economic experts driven by knowledge and not political agendas. This appeal to economic objectivity and expert governance aims at corrupting and destroying any shadow of disagreement and dissidence, any possibility for alternative critical and original thinking, and thus the possibility of actually finding a true solution for the crisis. This way of enforcing the solution to the crisis, about which we will certainly hear much in the next few days, gives rise to two terrible consequences. On the one hand, the breakdown of social cohesion at the national level. The measures included in the austerity packages affect in particular the young, unemployed or precariously employed, and the old retirees, those living on social entitlements and civil servants. And on the other, the breach of solidarity between European partners. The sovereign debt crisis has shown that the European Monetary Union has flaws in its design that in good times allowed or even promoted the accumulation of debt and in situations of crisis, crisis punishes the weakest economies of the Eurozone. At the same time, some of the solutions to the crisis, 
such as debt forgiveness or permanent mechanism of transferences, face stern opposition by the wealthy North, fed by a rhetoric based on cultural prejudices. Economic orthodoxy seems, therefore, not only to favor some national economies over others, showing how it is motivated by ideological commitments, but also that it constitutes a serious obstacle to think of Europe as a political unified entity. What strikes anyone observing the unfolding of this process is how damaging this is, even if, and we cannot but doubt it, uh, European politicians manage to solve the financial crisis. These two aspects will remain the perpetual source of resistance to the constitution of a real European demos, a name that is explicitly stated in the preamble to the European Treaty. We need to carefully consider these consequences because Europe is a fragile, virtual, unified entity having as the founding principles of that unity none of the traditional aggregators of diversity that more or less work at the national level. No common language, no cultural or religious identity. Such diversity is not necessarily problematic because what aggregates the political community are the common goals, the ideals of peace, solidarity, equality, universal access to social rights and respect for individual dignity. The virtual unity is founded upon the notion that our real strength is the shared nature of those ideals, the notion that only as a whole of diverse people united by a common end, we can hope to climb the ladder of prosperity, full employment, social progress, high level of social protection and eradication of poverty, the founding principles of the European Union. The notion that we will live a world that is better, fuller in terms of possibility, possibilities than that which was left to us is something we must still cling to and st strenuously defend. A society that promotes growth through scorched earth economic policy is not such a society. Now, these common goals are deeply intertwined with the nature of the procedures to achieve them. The complete tra transparency of decision-making process, a comprehensive accountability of decision, equal rights of participation to all citizens. The failure to deal with the economical crisis in a way that involves European citizens, both those rescuing and those rescued, has allowed the increase of questioning of democracy as the ideal form of governance. Debate and disagreement are seen not as a source of progress, but as an obstacle to development. I remember a former Portuguese finance minister and candidate to prime minister's suggestion of suspending democracy for six months, solving the problems of the country, and returning them to democracy." End of quotation. Although the suggestion may seem bizarre, the fact is that it has become recurrent in European politics at the supranational level, where non-elected bodies of governance decide, without public debate, new political structures, as well as social and economic policies that shape and reconfigure society beyond recognition. The risk for Europe is that this democratic deficit becomes associated with the breach of solidarity between European partners, fueled by the breakdown of social cohesion, and leads to a surge of national nationalism and a certain sort of nationalism. When the common good that arises above and beyond the competing individual interests is removed as the ultimate aim of politics, the risk we face is that, confronted with a non-working solution that prevents citizens to decide in any meaningful way the configuration of their societies, these citizens, or some of them, opt for even more removed forms of non-universal decision-making or to a complete indifference to politics. It is therefore an imperative to demonstrate that what makes these procedures faulty is precisely the ideal of democratic governance, legitimate representation, and freedom to act and choose in the absence of external coercion at the heart of the European project. The European project is a political one aimed at bringing peace and free freedom on the continent, of which the economic policies are just means to get there. It is not the case of simply arguing that something is wrong in the way European leaders have been dealing with the crisis, but that they need to act in a way that respects European citizens and European ideals. The claim is not to argue as the starting point for the discussion for an abstract ideal, but for a common practice that this solution is washing away. That is why the essential part of any solution to the European crisis must be the insistence in more legitimized participatory democratic decision-making at all levels 
and critical denial of all hegemonic, supposedly objective and ideologically neutral solutions. It used to be the way we get there that matter, but listening to contemporary European political discourse, it seems that the goal has become too narrow and the way to get there too simplistic. Academics need to engage into the public debate about the democratic deficits of European politics, but especially about the kind of society we want to live in. Before doing that, however, they need to be able to talk to each other coming from different fields and Alex will tell us more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Um, so another theme that is behind um, the, the symposium is the question of interdisciplinarity because of the prominence of the idea of expertise in this crisis. So the issue of participation and deliberative democracy in the context of what Philip just referred to as a state of exception leads us to consider the type of discourses that frame normalcy and exception, and therefore to the relationship between experts, crisis, and a conversation such as the one that we have organized here. The crises are foregrounded both in political practice and in academic exchange, a sharp division between experts and science on the one hand, and politicians and politi political decision making on the other. The division has often been expressed in the form of an opposition, which in turn has prompted much of the debate about legitimacy and the excesses of the democratic deficit. From a critical standpoint, the dichotomy, science versus politics, can however be seen as a couple of mutually reinforcing terms, which together enclose the debate, both political and academic, within the comfortable confines of enlightened liberalism. In that broad cultural frame, science draws its legitimacy, including political legitimacy, from one form of representation, the representation of truth, while politics draws its own legitimacy from another form of representation, the representation of the community's will. Representation constitutes the, breed, the bridge between them and allows for legitimation to also be mutual and reciprocal. Science legitimates politics as the domain of implementing will based on truth or authenticity, while it is legitimated by the political realm in the form of exclusion. Science is apolitical, independent, objective, and so on. And politics compromises on the basis of opinion and preferences that are, however, conveyed and considered in uncorrupted or distorted fashion. They never mix, but they support one another in sharing the same ideal of transparency. In that universe, that politics would be a science rather than an art or craft, or that science would be political would strike common sense as odd or disturbing. Famously, Max Weber once presented science and politics as separate vocations with distinct form of responsibility. Yet clearly, legitimation for each comes also from mutual idealization or reification. Politics is murky, shady, and about skill, while science is about objective merit and method. Both depictions are now understood to be simplistic or ideological in their own right. The perversity of the dynamic of science and politics is however shown in the crisis in the form of politics yielding completely to science, that very science that is idealized and homogenized. There is one truth out there, and the time for debate and opinion is over, in the sense that debate is pointless in the face of truth. Science presents itself, obviously, as the horizon of politics. In a way, when politicians are disparaged and cheerfully replaced by technocrats, the confusion of representations, the representation of truth and the representation of will, displays a dangerous notion about the closeness of liberal democratic institutions to the grounds of dictatorship. The will of the people is legitimating only in the extraordinary circumstances of order and peace. The crisis is such as a fundamental breach of normalcy in the sense that it shows that order and peace, the realm of the political and debate, have always constituted the continuation of war by other means to borrow Michel Foucault's reversal of Clausewitz's uh, famous formulation. That is, the imposition of a particular regime of truth and truth-making as part of the larger architecture of power and domination of some perspective over another. Progressively, as the responses to the crisis become more seemingly grotesque and obscene, one realizes that objective truth, a particular objective truth, will be enforced not against the will of the people, but against the notion that the will, or even the fate, of the people matters. 
In that sense, science, or particularly totalitarian view of science and the world, once made into policy, embodies the outer bounds of human agency, of history, and thus of messianic resignation. One idea behind this symposium is to practically question the assumptions behind the opposition of politics and expertise. One way of doing so is to experiment in interdisciplinarity, to recapture the meaning and purpose of inter interdisciplinarity as a practice. At one obvious level, the expertise that is mobilized to face the European crisis is a particular form of expertise, which constructs the crisis as a very specific type of event and problem, a form of expertise that is the product of the modern notion of science as disciplinarity, or as a disciplined and disciplining professional practice. For millions of people in Europe, and elsewhere obviously, the crisis has nothing, nothing to do with billions in public deficits, billions in public debt, and interest rates, and so on. Realities that have little reality as against the experience of hunger, anguish, despair, and rage in the face of the disappearance of all meaning. Governments have turned absurd, politics an incomprehensible farce, and the materiality of the world is found for some in the re-emergence of physical violence as a mean meaningful response to the structural violence of circumstances. Academics can contribute to the production of meaning of pro public debate by engaging in interdisciplinarity as a constrained political practice, as opposed to a quest for the better objective truth. Disciplinary specialization, followed by disciplinary alienation, followed by political disenfranchisement, can be offset by an effort at constructing a larger, more nuanced, and more far-reaching picture of what the crisis is, what it means, and what can come out of it. The goal is to reassert, especially against the crude, dictatorial, and unidirectional scientism of a particular economic thought, which incidentally has been disproved at many junctures for the past decades, that reality is constructed by some and endured by others. As a political practice, interdisciplinarity, critically understood, challenges the fatalism of a particular narrative about the crisis, operates a form of intervention against the viral circulation of that homogeneous picture of the crisis, and most of all reopens the dialogue about what is possible, what is impossible, and what is desirable. At bottom, interdisciplinarity as a practice of reaching out of one's professional enlistment is a way of reflecting on one's discipline's contribution to the reality and sense of crisis, and especially to the fact that the crisis, as we are told about it, is not a crisis at all. So the last thing is, the word crisis, as its etymolog et etymology suggests, refers to a moment of decision, a moment of sharp alternatives, or, as some have called it, the opening or reopening of the space of decidability. Famously, in the structure of scientific revolutions, the term crisis is used by Thomas Kuhn to refer to the experience of instability of scientific paradigms faced with an accumulation of failures in explanation and prediction. The European crisis is unfortunately, but quite sig significantly, not presented as a crisis, given that the recipes are ready-made and the alternative is really no alternative at all, but rather the end of the world, while for many the world has already ended. One hope that we had for this gathering, which is very odd by many academic standards, precisely because of the assumptions and givens of disciplinarity, is to elicit a richer, deeper, more generous, possibly more empathetic, and more tragic sense of the crisis. To follow what Philip just said, as a European crisis, it seems that European, Europeanity, oh, that's difficult, Europeanness, should be at the forefront of what is experienced as collapsing. Not the European Monetary Union, not the European Common Economic Policies, not the European Common Agricultural Policy, but Europe as a historical event and political project in and for the people and the planet. That the fate of European peoples and communities is subject to the same dictatorial and patronizing regime of truth that for decades and centuries Europe had imposed on its colonies and post-colonies intimates, among other things, the need for larger consideration of whether Europe is something to be salvaged, or whether, to paraphrase Gandhi, we should rather consider that Europe would be a good idea, yet to be born, yet to be implemented. So now, before we turn to our distinguished keynote speaker for today, Professor Kostas Lapavitsas, I would like to thank, on behalf, and again, on behalf of Philip and myself, people who have made this gathering and experiment possible. 
We would like to thank the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies, which has gener generously, very generously, sponsored this event and has provided all the logistical and administrative support needed for it to be possible. We would like to thank in particular Sammy Pilstrom, the Collegium Director, for his support and for coming today to open the symposium. We want to thank also Ms. Maria Tokyo. She's not here. Okay. Program coordinator who has publicized and handled public relations for the event with both usual and outstanding talent. She's very, very busy, so we are very grateful for her efforts. Most of all, we would like to acknowledge here the relentless and extraordinary work done by Ms. Kirsi Reyes Anastasio, program assistant, who has single handedly made this event physically possible by taking care of every single logistical and administrative detail. She's the one who has contacted you or some of you at one point or another to make sure that you know everything down, down to how exactly you should pack your suitcase. So thank you very much, Kirsi. Finally, we are very grateful to Anti Salinma, who is sitting there very discreetly, who has volunteered his time and energy to design the magnificent poster for the event, as well as the little brochures that you have found in the folders with the program of the conference. So without further ado, I'll ask Philip to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you.